quick disclaimer, this video went completely off the rails on me. It's about three times longer than I expected, but I'm at the point. I just simply don't care anymore. Just push it out and let's move forward. Uh, besides, a mistake is nothing more than a lesson learned and a mistake you don't have to make again, right? Um, I'll make sure to have my video editor throw in some timestamps in the description. Apologies for the delays and quite obviously if you don't make it to the end, very understandable. Hey folks, and as the title suggests, in this video we're going to jump into that whole microservices versus monoliths debate. Which I naively assumed was already dead, but apparently not. Um, one thing I do find quite surprising though is sometimes I'll go browse the job ads just to see what's out there. And it seems as though there's still quite a few firms that are utilizing microservices, or the smaller ones at least, which I find rather odd. Anyway, my name is Matt, core maintainer of Apex. I do loads of short and to the point videos regarding all things web development in general with a focus on PHP and Apex. If that by chance interests you, please make sure to like and subscribe. All right, and for that age old question, should you use microservices for your project? And the answer to this is actually extremely simple. If you are watching this video right now and are debating with yourself as to whether or not you should use microservices, then the answer is no, you really shouldn't. And the reason I say that is because you are going to take on so much additional tech debt in order to properly develop, deploy, and maintain a well-oiled microservices architecture that the only way it makes sense at all is if the benefits of doing so are so glaringly and overwhelmingly obvious to you that there is no debate in your mind. You just simply know you have to use microservices. In all other circumstances though, I can very safely say you're well, we are much better off using a monolith. And I will use this video to lay out my reasoning, which will be split into two parts. First, I'll go through the dangers of using microservices, and then afterwards, I'll go into the key aspects of what you're looking for in a well-structured, robust, and extensible monolith. And before we begin, a huge shout out to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Apex through its open source program. That was simply awesome of you guys. Um, I've been using DigitalOcean myself for years, well before Apex was even a thing, and I couldn't even dream of changing. They are simply the best out there, so if you ever need world-class hosting, make sure to check out DigitalOcean. And with all that out of the way, let's jump right into the video. I'm not going to bother getting into the definitions between the two architectures, as I don't want to waste anyone's time, and I'm assuming everyone watching this video already knows. If you by chance do not know, what I'll do is I will leave a link in the description to a video that gives a quick rundown between the two. Now before I start railing on microservices, let's listen to what some highly intelligent folks in the industry have said. For example, here's Jimmy Bogard at NDC conferences. So after 18 months, hundreds of developers on Bell's top hardware, they flipped a switch, went to the website, and nothing showed up. Which was rather embarrassing for quite a, a lot of people. Now let me reiterate, 18 months, hundreds of developers, Top of the line hardware, they flip the switch and crickets. Uh, I'll leave a link to these speeches in the description if you guys want to check them out. But in this case, what happened is the microservices ended up talking to each other in a bit of a circular pattern and they ended up with nine and a half minute page load times. Whoops. And also, we have Anthony Ferrara speaking at the UK PHP conference, giving his final thoughts after about an hour long speech explaining what it was like to manage the development of a microservices architecture. Start your services as microliths, as large as possible, because it is far easier to split apart a large system than it is to stitch two dynamic systems together, especially when there's a lot of dependencies and a lot of network traversal between them. Build it large, and then when you need to split or refactor something out, do that. It's far easier. My number one recommendation, <laughs> do not do microservices. Now, first we need to answer the question, what problem were microservices invented to solve? I can promise you it wasn't any technical related issue because from pretty much any technical vantage point, they are horrific, which I will explain in a minute. And there's actually one massive technical disadvantage to using them, which nobody ever seems to talk about. And I'll explain that at the end of this segment as well. 
Uh, but no, it was purely a decision by HR. What happened was the larger guys out there, like Netflix, Google, Amazon, their development teams got so massive that HR and the project managers could no longer manage them. So they split them up into small groups and it had nothing at all to do with technical requirements. It was simply done purely as an HR decision. So that means if you have less than say 50 developers on your project and you are utilizing microservices, I'm not saying you're doing it wrong, but you are not utilizing them for their intended purpose. Now let's jump into some of the quote unquote advantages of using microservices and break those down. One very commonly cited one is, oh, the autonomous nature and the simplicity of them make them extremely efficient and agile and just an all around great developer experience. And what the hell, no, that's just not true. That's a myth. Um, I'll give you an example. Say I'm in a system developing you know, whatever feature and I need to pull a customer record. Well, if I'm in a monolith, I just simply low in instantiate the customer repository, whatever class, call a method and get back a response, usually a instance of the customer model class, which is conveniently sitting right beside me in the same system. Now, if I'm in microservices though, it's a bit different. I have to instantiate my API client, call a method, it'll format a request, send that off to the microservice, and of course it has to be developed to gracefully handle timeouts when they occur. But when it does get a response, it has to check the status of the response, decode it, and now I just got a chunk of raw data sitting here. It'd be nice if I had a customer model class to fill it with, but that's sitting over there in that other microservice, which I don't have access to. So my options are I can write my own customer model class, I can use a generic DTO object, or I can just run with a raw array of data. None of which are very appealing options. And another one of the commonly cited advantages is that it provides the development teams with independence and the freedom and flexibility to choose their own stack and the right tools for the job that they have at hand. Which, all right, I get that and I can somewhat agree. You know, everyone loves less red tape and as a general rule of thumb, it's always in your best interest to let whoever's doing the work choose the tools and methodologies that they wish as quite obviously you're gonna get better work that way, right? However, I do also think that it's being a little bit short-sighted because at the end of the day, this thing has to come together to act like a cohesive, well-oiled well -oiled machine. And allowing everyone to do their own thing is gonna cause a loss of cohesion. There's kind of no way around that one. To give you an example of this, and since I love my analogies, let's say I'm a composer and I'm putting together an orchestra. It's equivalent of me telling each group of instruments within the orchestra, ah, go ahead, go practice on your own. Don't worry about practicing as a group. Here's the sheets of music, go do your thing. And say they practice for months on end every day and they absolutely perfect the, the music. I can't possibly expect them to all come together in the room and all of a sudden hammer out a really cohesive and beautiful song, right? That's just not realistic. And that's the equivalent of allowing the t development teams in a microservices architecture to work independently. You are gonna have a loss of cohesion there. And for the last of commonly cited advantages, and I just realized this video is gonna be a lot longer than anticipated, so I'll do my best to be quick. All right, it greatly reduces unnecessary management overhead and bureaucracy. Now this one I can actually understand and get behind, but let's explore it a little bit more. So once again, I love my analogies. So let's say we have two companies of soldiers, 200 soldiers each, two commanders, they have the same objective. The first commander decides he's gonna take all 200 soldiers at the same time, and they're gonna to march together towards the objective. So it's large, it's slow, it's bulky, it's confusing, it's loud, it's messy, but all 200 are there at the same time. They're progressing towards the objective. They can see how far they pro progress. They can see how much further there is to go. The commander can see them all. And if somebody has a problem, everyone can see that problem and jump in to help out. Now, commander number two over here, he's decided to take the agile route. So he split up the 200 soldiers into 20 teams of 10. He's wrote out a mission plan for each of, each of the 20 groups, gave it to them, sent them off on their way. They all sprawled out in 20 different directions. So 
now the commander's there, he doesn't really know where the soldiers are, the soldiers don't know where each other is, they don't know how much progress or if there's been any problems, they just know what the objective is and hope at the end of the day or week that that objective is reached. Now which commander do you think has a more difficult time in management? The one in front of 200 soldiers and can see them all or the one in charge of 20 groups of 10 soldiers who are all spread out everywhere, right? And one final massive technical detriment, which nobody ever seems to mention in these conversations, and I'm not sure why. Um, it's almost as if you are throwing the baby out with a bathwater here. It's kind of like you're taking this large, beautifully structured database with proper indexes and foreign key constraints, and then you're just slicing the hell out of it into about 12 different pieces and then firing each piece off onto its own separate server, isolated server. I mean, why would you do that? Um, these database engines such as PostgreSQL and MySQL are very, very powerful and if utilized properly can do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. If you get a well-architected database schema with proper indexes and constraints, and then add in some views, stored procedures, triggers, generated or functional columns, partitioning, and things of that nature. It can do a lot of the functional aspects of your software, making your code cleaner and your software system itself more efficient. And not only that, it also makes aggregating all that data and pulling out beautiful analytics and reports much easier. And you are just leaving all that functionality on the table by utilizing microservices. And not only that, you know full well whoever you're developing these systems for is going to want their analytics. So now you're stuck developing out a reporting microservice, which has to run around and aggregate all the data from all the other microservices. And now you have duplicate data to work with, which you have to work around and ensure it stays in sync with all the data from all the other services, which in and of itself would be a complete nightmare. And oh my God, why would you do that to yourself if you don't have to? Plus, instead of writing software, you will most likely find yourself putting in huge amounts of time to develop out things such as dev tooling, logging, debugging, DevOps and deployment strategies, network monitoring and traffic analysis, a circuit breaker pattern, which doesn't even actually exist in a monolith, and a bunch of other things of that nature. Um, I think Anthony Ferrara had it perfectly correct, who was mentioned in, earlier in this video. Start big and slice down to microservices as necessary. The analogy I always love to use is you cannot unscramble a scrambled egg. You know, if you start with a large monolith, it's relatively easy to slice off chunks of that monolith and flip them over to a microservice if and when necessary. However, if you just start with microservices and then you decide when you flip the switch, you get crickets and you decide, oh, maybe we should go to a monolith. Well, there's no way to do that. That's called a rewrite. Anyway, uh, enough about me railing on microservices. Let's jump into what you should be looking for in a well-structured and robust monolith. So now what to look for in a well-structured, robust and extensible monolith. We'll do this from a couple different vantage points. One, we want it structured in a way so if and when necessary in the future, we can easily slice chunks of it off and flip them over into microservices. And second, with under the understanding that as team lead or someone overseeing the project, it's going to be a whole lot easier to manage and keep things together if you are able to get a bird's eye view of one large repo versus having 12 separate projects out there to try and keep tabs on. Honestly, nothing here is very unique, special, or even anything new for that matter, which I think is kind of the whole essence of this debate. Microservices are newer, so everyone just assumes new equals better, which just simply isn't always the case. And not to sound egotistical or anything here, but I actually think Apex has this right. So first thing is you want to modularize everything. So inside most systems, you have your app or SRC directory, and inside there you'll see directories like interfaces, models, controllers, and whatever else. Uh, take those, flip those up a directory. So instead, inside your SRC or app directory, you'll have, say, users orders, invoices, shipping, products, and so on. And then inside those directories, you put controllers, interfaces, models, and things of that nature. And then you just simply let every developer or group know, here's your directory, this is your module, your playground, do whatever you want with it. 
but the rest of the system is here for you to snoop around and check it out, see what's available to you, see what everyone else is up to, but stick with your module. Uh, whether or not you want to enforce any type of directory structure on those module directories is up to you. I personally wouldn't, just let developers do their thing, but that choice is yours. Uh, granted, this does mean all developers will have to conform to the same tech stack, but at the end of the day, it is your job to make sure this entire system gets deployed like a well-oiled machine. And I understand that it does take away from autonomy, which can lead to more alas. But at the same time, 18 months of work and flipping the switch to get crickets is probably a good morale killer too. Then simply select really solid packages for things like the router, handling configuration variables, services container, event messaging, logging, and things of that nature. And then inside each module directory within the SRC or app directories, allow for one main module configuration file. Whether that's YAML or JSON format, doesn't matter. But here, simplicity is king. Do not overcomplicate it, keep it as simplistic as possible. And then just let other developers know whenever you need to add a new root or register a new service, simply add it here in this file, run this one command, and it will update the entire system, making that available to you and the rest of the team on the system. Each module should also have its own set of database migrations, as there is no reason whatsoever to keep all database migrations in one central location when you are working on a system this large. If necessary, just simply enforce a rule that says, make sure you prefix your database tables with the name of your module. Whether you enforce that just verbally or through the CI pipeline is up to you, but really that should be all that's needed. And this allows developers to easily update the database as necessary without getting bogged down with everyone else's migrations. This also very much simplifies both dev tooling and DevOps, as there is no reason you can't just distribute a docker compose.yml file throughout the team and have them run docker compose up. It'll pull everything necessary from the repository and within minutes they have a local working copy of the latest code based on their machine. If one of your perceived hurdles is oh, then everyone has to download this massive Git repo and this is huge and bulky and what a mess. Um, one suggestion I can actually give you is to maybe check out SVN for a version control system. Because one of the things SVN does beautifully is directory based checkouts. So there is no requirement at all to download the entire repository like Git requires. And instead, developers can just specify a certain directory within that repository, and it'll, it'll just check out that one directory and version control it. And taking that a step further, it really wouldn't be that difficult if necessary to set up things so developers could just run a quick command and a new remote staging or development environment would be set up for them on subdomain.domain.com or something. And then you can just have them check out that single directory from SVN and this way they only have the directory they're working with on their local machines and set up the repository so anytime a commit is made to their directory it'll automatically sync with their remote development environments they have set up for their own testing. Uh, that really wouldn't be difficult and it would alleviate any of that undue burden of having to download the full repository which seems like it's a huge turnoff for folks. Then, as you can see, it really wouldn't be that difficult to rip out one of the modules and flip it over into a microservice if and when necessary. Honestly though, for probably a good 99.5% of the use cases out there, this type of structure will work perfectly fine and handle your business operations without any problem and with far more stability, simplicity, and less frustration. Anyway, that's it for this video. Uh, my apologies, this one kind of went completely off the rails on me. It's about three times longer than I expected. And I'm not sure because I'm blind, but I may have even changed my shirt a couple times during this one. Uh, whatever though, live and learn, right? Nonetheless, if you're still here, thank you very much for your time. I truly appreciate it. Please make sure to like and subscribe if you're feeling generous. Share this video around. Take care, and I will see you in the next video.